Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number... Are we on episode number nine? Yes, I, I, I think. Episode number nine of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, that is Gavin. Gavin, we have reached the point where I've forgotten exactly how many episodes we've done. So incredibly professional we are. <laughs> Very early on in the process. You can tell that this so, is definitely what we do for a living, yeah. We're professional oh, podcasters, absolutely. yeah. And if, uh, if anybody would like to pay us... To, uh, to do this podcast, we are listening. <laughs> so this podcast is coming out on uh, on Wednesday the 3rd, so Gavin's got his trusty calendar here. Gavin, what are we talking about? What has happened on Wednesday the 3rd in history that we need to be aware of? So, Wednesday, February 3rd, 2014, the headline is, Scientists Predict Future Giant Rat Takeover. Is this anywhere specific, or are the giant rats just going to be everywhere? Well, Jan... And how giant is giant? We'll see. Let's see. Jan <laughs> Zaliswiski, or Zaliswitsk? I, I'm sure I butchered that, so I'm very sorry if that person ever hears this. A professor of paleobiology at the University of uh, Leicester in England published a study theorizing that, given the current extinction rate of large mammalian species... Rats show great potential to thrive, spread, and most disturbingly, grow. <laughs> Basing his research on island ecosystems where rats generally invade and then dominate. Uh, God, I'm going to butcher this again. Zaleswitz said the adaptability and resilience of the common rat uniquely positions it as the mammalian species most likely to thrive in the coming millennia. You know, I spent... You know, quite a bit of time thinking about how artificial intelligence was going to take over humanity, but in reality, it was the rats. It was the rats I had to worry about. It's it's like that meme of like the two astronauts on the moon. You mean like you mean it was you mean it was rats the whole time? It always, always has, has been. been. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose we're gonna have to do like a sequel to this podcast instead of "I wish you were dead" a podcast about things that used to be alive. It is "I really, really wish we were dead" because now we've been taken over by rats. Or it's like "I wish you were rats," like a podcast about yeah. things that uh, about a podcast about our future rat overlords. You know, <laughs> well, a spinoff series if there ever was. <laughs> So, um, if you are listening to this, I certainly hope that you have listened to our last episode, episode 8, where Gavin and I attempted to go through the last 600 million years in 60 minutes. And Gavin, how well did that go for us? Uh, we came up uh, a little short. A little short. We got how through uh, about 100 and... Nope. Uh, we have 145-ish million years left. So, we got through roughly 455 million years. So that's better than two. We got like 70% of the way there. That's like a gentleman's C, if I had to say so myself. I'll take it. And uh, and this is going to be kind of the part two to that episode. So I guess it's going to be 600 million years in 120 minutes. But either way, I think it's still going to be quite a bit of fun. And we get to start off with uh, one of the one of the few things or one of the few periods of time that I've actually heard of before, <laughs> the Cretaceous period. So Gavin, go ahead and, uh, and take us away and tell us why the Cretaceous period is just so interesting. Yeah, the Cretaceous, wonderful time. You know, the final period of the Mesozoic era. Um, so, continuing our theme, the Cretaceous lasted from uh, about 145 to about 66, not 65, million years ago, lasting roughly 80 million years, 81 million years, somewhere around there. Uh, it had more oxygen than we do today, about 150% of what we have today. Six times pre-industrial carbon dioxide, so pretty warm, and four degrees above, you know, modern temperatures. All of the biggest dinosaurs of all time lived during here during this time period. Uh, you know, things like uh, T. Rex is from the very very end of the Cretaceous. Uh, Titanosaurs, which are the largest sauropod dinosaurs, um, the ones that are like larger than a house. Couple really weird groups. Um, there's the dromaeosaurs, or as most people would call them, raptors, things like Velociraptor. We have uh, a group called Marginocephalians, which is a fancy name for the group that includes Triceratops and other Ceratopsians, as well as Pachycephalosaurs, the like headbutt dinosaurs, even though we're pretty sure that they didn't actually headbutt, but that's a separate topic for a separate time. 
We have uh, ankylosaurs. You know, the big, like, armored dinosaurs with, like, the club tails. Those were around during this time. Basically, any of the cool dinosaurs, any of the cool dinosaurs, this is when they were around, right? Pretty much. With the exception of, like, Stegosaurus. You know, there were, right. Stegosaurus might have had a couple, like, cousins that made it into, like, the early part of the Cretaceous. But by the end, their their group was pretty much gone. And that nepotism doesn't count here. No, no, it does not. Um, pterosaurs, the big flying reptiles, not dinosaurs. Um, they were still around. They were a lot less prominent than they were during the Jurassic, but now they're really, really big, like real big, like on the ground. They're like giraffe sized, real weird. Um, but they could still fly. And some of them had like 40 foot wingspans, which is heckin' crazy. Uh, and part of the reason why we think that they were a lot less prominent, especially like small ones were because birds, you know, that's, that's really highly debated, but um, it is a potential reason why some of like the smaller ones weren't doing so hot because birds um, might have been just like generally more efficient, you know, better flyers, uh, better at catching insects, which is probably what a lot of them were eating at the time. Mammals, still relatively small, but were pretty relevant and important in their ecosystems. So s- small in size, important in impact. And most of the insect groups that we see today show up in the Cretaceous, things like ants, Termites, uh, butterflies, aphids, grasshoppers, some wasps, not quite all of them, but a lot of like the... So we'd recognize quite a lot of the animals that were around, even though, you know, there were dinosaurs. There's also a lot of things that we would at least kind of, you know, casually recognize. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, And you really sort of start to get that as far back as like, probably like the early Triassic um, maybe, maybe into the Jurassic where it's like, okay, there's a lot of things like there are some things where I'm like, I don't quite know what that is just by looking at it, but I feel like the average person would be able to point at it pretty much everything and be like, I at least can name a group that you are a member of, whether it's like you are a dinosaur, you are a pterosaur, a bird, a mammal, an, an ant, or even just like an insect. But a big part of why insects were doing super well at this time is because for the first time, although this is an asterisk because a recent paper came out potentially pushing this date back uh, back in time a little bit into like the Triassic. But to my knowledge, we have flowers for the first time, which is crazy, right? We think, you know, flowering plants are a large majority of the plants that we have around today. But they show up for the first time even like toward the end of the Cretaceous. So they haven't even been around for like a million or a hundred million years today, which is crazy. Now, when you're saying that there's flowers, like one, I'll ask the same question as I asked before, are these kind of flowers that we would recognize today? We'd look at that and go, that's a flower or that's a flower, but I've never seen anything that looks quite like that before. Like what, how would my girlfriend be happy if I gave her some <laughs> of these flowers? Probably. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I am not, a, a plant person. I, I wish that I knew more about plants, but I, I just don't. Um, mostly because plants and animals don't tend to fossilize in the same places. They have different, um, you know, plants like a certain type of, uh, they like more of like an acidic environment to, to be preserved. Animals don't quite like that when they want to be preserved. So you don't tend... That's, re- that's interesting. I never would have guessed that. Yeah, you don't find them together too often. What you find a lot with animals are like pollen spores, or like seeds, things like that, um, mm-hmm. but not quite the actual like plants themselves. You, you still do, but it's it's pretty rare. I see. And have we gotten to uh, have we gotten to a period of time when there's grass yet? I know last time we kept talking about how there was no grass anywhere on the earth. Are we are we finally at a point where there's some green? We sure are. There is just a little yes. bit. Yes. Um, it's not quite the grass that you like. You look outside in your lawn, and you see grass. It's probably be- because bamboo is technically a grass. If there's any botanists that are listening, please don't roast me. Like I said, I don't know plants. To my knowledge, bamboo <laughs> is technically a grass. So technically I, correct. I would think that the grasses around this time were more bamboo-like than like what's in your yard. But we have our first technical grass. Not super prevalent yet, and it won't be for still quite a while at this point, but we have it now. Um... And, uh, you know, when most people think about the Cretaceous, they think about all the cool stuff going on on land with, like, the birds, the dinosaurs, the mammals, whatever. The oceans were crazy at this time. There's a gigantic sea 
basically cutting North America right in half. All the way from like northern Canada, basically the North Pole, Pole down to like the Texas Gulf Coast. Uh, that's called the Western Interior Seaway. And that was there for about, you know, close to 20, 25 million years. Now, does North America look like North America that we recognize today? Is Pangaea still a thing? And this is just over the land that would become North America? What what does the Earth look like in terms of, you know, tectonic plates? So by this point, North America was by itself. Pangaea was completely broken up. Um, I Yeah, I don't believe North America was still touching, um, like, Eurasia, Africa. Some of the southern continents were still together um, by this point. South America was still with Africa and, and uh, Antarctica and Australia. All three of those, or all four of those were still together. But by this point, North America was by itself. Eurasia was mostly by itself. And like I said, the southern continents all still pretty close together. Gotcha, gotcha. So in this gigantic seaway, lots and lots of stuff kicking around. Plesiosaurs, once again, your Loch Ness Monster type animals. Really, really common. And by this point, they diversified to no longer just be, you know, long neck, tiny head animals. Some of them, their head was like a quarter of the length of their body. Massive, massive heads. <laughs> like, um, oh God, basically like the size of a bus or bigger. <laughs> um, I mean, like total animal, not not just their head. Um, right. Right. But just massive, massive, massive animals. Um, ichthyosaurs, the first true group of like fully aquatic reptiles, not doing so hot. They they were super all, uh, common and doing really well in the Triassic, and then after the end Triassic mass extinction, not doing so hot. And then they just never really recovered from that. So they were extinct before the end of the Cretaceous, and you know we all know how that ends. But um, or do we? Well, I mean, we did sort of have an episode about it. Episode three. <laughs> I'm assuming people have listened to that episode, but it might not be. If you were if you were a newcomer to uh, to our podcast, it might be a little bit more complicated than you think. We'll we'll touch on it, but so they were definitely extinct before the end of the Cretaceous. A couple new marine groups as well, including some of the biggest ones, which are mosasaurs. Basically, um, the big thing at the end of Jurassic World, <laughs> the big thing that lives in like their little lake. Um, so okay. they evolved from squamates, which is the group that includes real, like true lizards and snakes. So most people call dinosaurs like, oh, just giant lizards when that's not technically true. They're not lizards, not even really that closely related, but these were actual lizards. Fun fact. Uh, lots of other groups in the oceans doing super well. Uh, ammonites, those, you know, swirly shelled squid boys doing incredibly well. So, so... Swirly shelled squid boys. That's, I mean, do you have a better description of them? Oh, oh, not even a little bit. I didn't think so. Uh, <laughs> they're doing super well. We like actually, a squirtle or something or a bulbasaur? I don't know. I don't know, Pokemon, something like that. Oh, my God. No, these are just like a... Imagine like a squid, but instead of having like the squishy part, but like behind its eyes, so it's got all the arms, then the eyes, and then like the squishy part. Instead of having the squishy part, as a shell that, like, sort of makes, like, a spiral pattern. Wow. Very, very wow. common. Very common. Um, so much so that, and, and so diverse that we use them to tell time in the Cretaceous and throughout a lot of the Mesozoic era, where it's like, if you have this particular species, because they evolved so quickly, um, if you have this particular species, you know pretty much exactly where and when you are during the entire Mesozoic era. So, very common. Well, very, very useful and incredibly important group of animals. Teleosts, which are the large majority of fish that we have around today. Um, they were around earlier on, but this is when they start to become really, really common. And when you might even be able to recognize like certain groups of fish, not just like, hey, that's a fish. But it's like, oh, this is like almost kind of like a bass or almost like a herring. I don't really know fish that well. Anyway. And sharks also looking a lot more like regular sharks. There were some ones earlier with like super weird stuff like on their heads or like there's one that has teeth that like we don't even know how it used them. Um, if they you, were there. They, they were there. We don't know what they did, but they were there. But anyway, the, the sharks and, and, you know, stingrays and stuff start to become more common and also a lot more recognizable as like regular sharks. 
But as it has been for the previous four mass extinctions, just when life is going all hunky dory, Boom. life gets pretty bad. Um, so this one is known as the KPG extinction, formerly known as the KT extinction for reasons that I can explain at some point in the future. Most people think that it was just, you know, big rock hits earth, life dies. As we've talked about, a lot more complicated than that. Uh, it was a combination of big rock hits earth. Also, uh, some volcanism called the Deccan Traps, which basically all of India was erupting in lava for a few hundred thousand to a million years. Really bad. Um, some pretty drastic sea level drops. Um, and then disease question mark. That's like a, that's like a hypothesis that's been floated about a lot, but it's like, there's no evidence for it, but it's like one of those things that's like, what would the evidence for that even be? You know, it's not falsifiable. So you could never, you know, it's one of the things you could never rule out, but you just consistently find, you know, very little to no evidence of. It, exactly. So it's like, maybe, but it's, it's something that we probably will never be able to know. So it's not really worth talking about all that much. Same thing, like, over, over the years, people have proposed different things like um, gamma ray bursts or things from, like, radiation from space, basically, causing some of these mass extinctions. But it's like, okay, but one, once again, there's no real way to prove that, where it's like, okay, that might be able to explain some of this, uh, you know, extinction, but it's like, there's no way to actually prove it. So why are we talking about this? Anywho... A lot of stuff died, uh, regardless of the cause, <laughs> or likely multiple causes. A lot of stuff died. Dinosaurs, minus birds, gone. Completely gone. Uh, pterosaurs, gone. They don't have any descendants today. All of the giant marine reptiles, the plesiosaurs, the, the mosasaurs, gone. Ammonites, the swirly-shelled squid boys, unfortunately, gone. Ooh, that hits. That hits home. Mm -hmm. That one hits different. Fish, not terribly affected. They seem to kind of do okay. There's a couple, like, relatively large groups that go extinct, but in general, they, they weren't affected all that much by it, from what we can tell. And there are many different subgroups of invertebrates that, you know, don't do all that well after this either. As usual, corals hit really hard. Yeah, but this, this one was weird. In that, sort of like I mentioned at the end of the Jurassic, where it's like some groups did okay across this, and then others did really not okay. And for mostly we don't know why, with one exception. Freshwater animals tended to do pretty pretty well. Again, not quite sure why, but if you lived in freshwater, so like amphibians uh, tended to do pretty okay. Freshwater fish tended to do pretty okay. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of plants. You know, their diversity didn't really go down, but there was just a lot less of them, which you know would happen if you blocked out the sun for a couple of years. And lastly, one thing that we do know is that basically everything, with a couple asterisks, over about fifty pounds, went extinct. Well, again, one of those things that, that would include you and me. That sure would. Uh, humans would have gone extinct if we were around at this time. Um, and some of the exceptions are um, some of, like, the big amphibians um, at the time. You know, there were still some of, like, the some holdovers from, you know, back before the dinosaurs even existed. They were still sort of just barely hanging on, and they, you know, continued to hang on through this. Uh, crocodilians also made it, um, but at, the, at, the, at this time, they had mostly lived in uh, freshwater, so that somehow sh sort of shielded them from the extinction. Um, but more or less, if your species in general got over about 50 pounds, yeah, you were gone. Which then leads us into kind of the next, is it a new era or is it a new period or what's the, uh, what is the next period of time that we're talking about? It is both. So the, like, I, oh! like I said, the Cretaceous is the last period in the Mesozoic era. So that leads us into the next era, the current one that we are still in called the Cenozoic and into a period called the Paleogene. And, well, I'll talk a little bit about the Paleogene first, but then I'll talk about how we talk about time a little bit, too. 
So the Paleogene went from 66 million years ago to about 23.03 million years ago, because now that we're getting a little closer to the, to the present, we can actually get some pretty fine resolution on our time scales here. But it lasted about 43 million years, so quite a bit shorter than a lot of the previous periods that we've talked about. Less oxygen than in the Cretaceous, but more than we have now, about 130% of what we have now. Relatively less um, carbon dioxide, only about two times uh, pre-industrial CO2, but still about four degrees above modern, still pretty hot. And you know, once we get into the Cenozoic, we generally talk about the epics, the, the um, sort of section of time smaller than a period. Once we get into the Cenozoic, we talk about those instead of the, the periods, just because we have a lot more data to work with, which means that, you know, it's, it's more generally just more useful for people to talk about the, the epics than it is to talk about the actual periods themselves. So from here on out, we're going to break up what we're talking about into those epics. So the first epic of the Paleogene is called the Paleocene. Confusing, I know. It's convenient. Yeah. Um, so this one only lasts about 10 million years, so it went from 66 to 56 million years ago. The early record isn't all that good just because, uh, you know, it's just, you know, immediately post-mass extinction. There just wasn't a lot of stuff around. By the end, most of, like, the large groups of mammals were around, though. So things like your persodactyls, which are your group that includes horses, rhinos, and tapers, your uh, artiodactyls, which is uh, basically anything else with hooves. Um, primates were around. Rodents were around. Like I said, every like large scale group of mammals uh, was around by the end of the Paleocene. Uh, mammals also just start to get larger in size. Uh, in the Cretaceous, you know, Jurassic, they were mostly eating bugs because they were just you know pretty small, and that was what they could eat. To by the end, eating things like fruit. And even being sort of omnivorous, which was the first time that that had really happened for mammals. Ooh. Birds get crazy diverse after this and also get kind of weird, uh, <laughs> including one species uh, that was giant, you know, six plus foot tall, flightless and herbivorous. So it's not one of the big, you know, meat eating birds that we see uh, more more recently. Um, thankf thankfully not around today, but closer to today than these are. Um, and also potentially we have our first penguins. Yeah. These are, these are birds that definitely sound like they could take Australia in a war if they were around today. Uh, I believe this, this specific giant one. Oh, that's an excellent reference that I just got. Um, that, that took you longer than it should have. It sure did. The great emu wars. Anyway. The great emu war. I, I think this bird was in Europe, mostly the specific one. Um, let's see what else we got snakes. We got lots and lots of snakes and lizards here. Almost all of the, you know, same thing with mammals, all of the, like the big scale lizard and snake groups were around, including the largest snake of all time called Titanoboa. <laughs> is that a real thing? Oh, it's a real thing. That's its actual name. That's like, that is its genus. <laughs> its genus is Titanoboa. <laughs> guess how long this, guess how long this snake is, Mike? Okay, so ignoring any obvious jokes I might make about that. For, but, for reference, um, the longest snake around today is the reticulated python. Generally, I think the longest one ever recorded was in like the mid-20s of feet. So as you tell us this, I am going to quickly plug in my microphone so that oh. way <laughs> our, uh, our listeners can hear. So I don't know if anybody uh, so far has noticed a drop in audio quality, but I'm sure that you did. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Well, Gavin tells us more about this giant snake. It's like 45-ish feet long. This is a gigantic heckin' snake. Like, there's no snake alive that can eat like a full-grown person today. This would easily, like, this would swallow you whole. Mostly because that's all snakes can do. But this thing, oh my god, this thing could eat like a hippo. Maybe not quite that big, but you get my point. That's a real big snake. After that, insects still getting really, really diverse, mostly because of flowers, you know, because insects are sort of like the main pollinators of flowers. There's there's a really, really good correlation, like so strong of a correlation that we're pretty sure that it is like causation 
of like the increase of diversity in flowering plants and of insects. And this also potentially also helped increase with the bird diversity too, because birds are also sort of pollinators, uh, but they also, like I mentioned, eat those insects. So um, birds, insects, flowering plants, all doing super well here. Um, so yeah, so as, so as good as, you know, birds and insects and flowers were doing, uh, all those marine vertebrates that were not doing all that well from the, you know, and Cretaceous extinction, still not doing all that hot until toward the end, uh, which makes sense. It usually, from what we can tell, takes between like seven and 10 million years for life to get sort of back to normal after mass extinction. So that makes sense. And that ends the Paleocene. Moving on to the Eocene, which is... Uh, 56 to 33.9 million years, lasting 22.1 million years. And it is real hot. Real, real hot at the beginning. Uh, during an How event. hot is real hot? Well, from what we can tell, it lasted for about 20,000 years. Increases of 6 to 8 degrees, meaning about 14 degrees Fahrenheit. That seems significant, like like even more so than anything that gets talked about today in terms of climate change being a problem. Like, that's nuts. Yeah. Uh, so the average global temperature, again, from the data we have, was about 73 degrees Fahrenheit, which doesn't seem all that bad. But considering today that we're currently at about 60 degrees average global temperature, so incredibly hot. Uh, so this, this period... Um, or this, you know, event is called the uh, PETM, or the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. This is one of the hottest times that there has ever been on the planet. Um, but as we have talked about before, um, the magnitude of a change isn't necessarily the the killer. It's the, the rate. And, you know, this happened over 20,000 years, which is a very short amount of time but enough that it didn't totally, like, destroy life, you know? Uh, right. And because of this, because of all this heat, dwarfism in animals, or, like, dwarf species, seem to be relatively common. Mostly just because bigger things, you know, tend to, you know, retain more heat. So being small helped you stay kind of cool. Um, as I mentioned, most modern animal orders sort of begin begin here, you know, it's kind of debatable whether certain groups begin in the Paleocene or the Eocene, but they're all for sure here in the Eocene. Um, right. Bats, we have our first uh, evidence of bats, which is pretty significant. Bats do not have a good fossil record at all. Um, we have our first proboscideans, which is the group that elephants are in. Pretty neat. I, d until doing the research for this episode, I did not think that Proboscideans went back this far, but that's actually really neat. We have. And you said those were elephants. Elephants and their cousins, um, like mammoths. So mammoths are true elephants. They're in the family Elephantidae. There are lots of others. Um, there are like, let's see, mastodons are in a separate family. Um, there's a weird group of them called Gomphotheres, which uh, are more commonly referred to as like shovel tusks elephants. A lot of them had tusks on the bottom too. Real weird. But they all have like, they're all big. They all have some form of a trunk. And most of them had tusks. Uh, really weird group. I love proboscideans so much. Um, <laughs> we also have more giant birds. But the carnivorous edition. Especially down in South America. Um, and for the first time, we have whales. And sirenians, which are uh, manatees and dugongs. So we have our I'm first. Sorry, say that last one again. Manatees and what? Dugongs. And yes, I know that that is the name of a Pokemon. I am aware, but it is also a real group of animals. Um, they're basically like manatees, but a little less chunky. Manatees are, you know, like the big chunky guys. Dugongs are a little more streamlined. Mo they mostly live in like Asia and Africa. Um, but yeah, so we have our first fully aquatic uh, mammals by this time. Deciduous trees, you know, the trees that lose their leaves with seasons, began to take over because they could actually handle all these weird temperature variations going on at the time better than, you know, pine trees, conifers could. So this is when they first start to become really, really common. 
grasses, once again, they're around, still not all that common. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> this is funny. This bullet in my notes literally just says palm trees in Alaska, LOL. Uh, <laughs> Can't confirm. <laughs> so yeah, this is how hot it was in that in what is now present day Alaska, which is not all that different location wise to where it is today. There were actual palm trees, which is crazy. And the reason why this period ends and starts to cool down is because by the by the end of the Eocene, uh, like I said, around 33, 34 million years ago, Antarctica has fully moved really close to the South Pole. It is fully isolated from uh, South America and Africa. It might still be barely connected to Australia at this time, but I don't remember that for sure. Um, but it's now close to the South Pole. And because of that, started growing some ice sheets, which overall cooled uh, global temperatures and transitions us into the next epoch, which is called the Oligocene or Oligocene, depending on who you ask. So that one ranges from 33.9 to 23.03 million years ago. It's really easy to see at the beginning of all of these, just how, like you said, we are going into, I believe you said um, epics or epochs now, mm -hmm. just how like the division of time is getting so much closer together just because we have, you know, way better lines of demarcation at this point. It's really easy to see that just looking mm -hmm. at the, the spans of time that we're talking about. And like, don't get me wrong. We do have, uh, epics, uh, for like the, the Cretaceous, the Jurassic, you know, the Devonian, you know, all the other periods, but just the amount of data we have for each of them is not as good as the amount of data we have for each of these epics in the Cenozoic. So, which makes sense. Those divisions do still exist. They just have less in them from, you know, you know, less didn't happen, but we just have less preserved. So, Oligocene lasted only about 11 million years, a little less than 11 million years. Global temperatures really starting to cool off, like I said, from about 14 degrees above uh, the, the source that I read for this uh, said it was about 14 degrees above the average of the mid-1990s. So this is, you know, well into the industrial. So 14 degrees above, like, 1995 <laughs> in the Eocene. But then we, once we get to the Oligocene, only about 4 degrees above. So a really significant 10-degree swing. Um, as South America continues southward to be on the actual pole. South America. You mean Antarctica? What did I say? You said South America. Oh, well, South America is also sort of getting there. But yes, I did mean Antarctica. <laughs> but South America is now completely isolated and gets real weird. Uh, I will talk I'm all about... for this. How do they get weird? How do they get weird? So just being isolated for so long, um, you start to just de develop groups that don't show up anywhere else. Uh, I have this a full episode planned uh, eventually for just about South America and how North America basically crashed into South America and killed everything that was there. <laughs> um, so we will have a whole episode dedicated just to like South America, because that's how much I love all the weird craziness that's going on in South America at this time. Um, so keep an eye out for that. But basically just lots of weird groups that you almost never see anywhere else until North America crashes into it. Some, uh, you know, 30 million years after, you know, this time only about two to three million years ago from current time. So South America was by itself for like a little over 30 million years. So a lot of weird stuff happened, but we will talk about that in depth later. Uh, grasses becoming way more common at this point, but still not like open grassland. Like you would see like out in the great plains or like the African savanna. Uh, like we like we see today, um, but in general, you know, you would look at a lot of landscapes and be like, okay, that looks familiar. Um, fewer trees, generally more open habitats, and that allowed for animals to get larger. Um, con considering what they were in the Eocene, those like dwarf form to to protect themselves from the heat. Now, because you know there's less trees and it's a little cooler, animals can get bigger, including. The largest land man mammals of all time, basically a giant hornless rhino on stilts. Wow. Yep. Um, roughly, I, th I think at least weight estimates was like this animal weighed like four times as much as an elephant or so. <laughs> four times as much as an elephant? Yep. 
Good. Wow. Yep. Uh, if you feel so inclined to look it up, it is an animal called Paraceratherium. So P A R A C E R A T H E R I U M. You will see it, and I, I promise that the description of a giant hornless rhino on stilts is accurate. I will take your word. One of my, again, one of my favorite animals, just because they're so weird. Um, horses become sort of modern, and the reason I mention that is because horses are mostly what I study. Yes, I am a horse girl. <laughs> we have some. You're early... my horse girl. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> my little pony. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we have uh, our first canids <laughs> and felids here, which are your dogs and cats. Oh, that's exciting. So once again, I'll ask the same question. I'm kind of getting used to asking this question. I'm assuming these are a lot more feral than anything that you know we would be used to today. So w- when I say dogs and cats, I mean the, the family that they belong to. So that would be, you know, the family canidae includes uh, wolves. It includes maned wolves, coyotes, foxes, um, so the, the family Canidae and the family Felidae first show up here. But collectively, we just refer to everything in both of those families as dogs and cats. Gotcha. Um, and honestly, like in the oceans, it's basically modern. You know, obviously there are some exceptions, but life in the oceans is basically similar to what we see today with the exception of like, whales were a little more primitive we didn't have like the truly giant giant whales yet but more or less modern and one of the most important things at least you know relevant to us today happens here which is uh, modern ocean current circulation is pretty much the same thanks to antarctica being completely isolated isolated uh meaning the i forget the name of that current but it's, it's the current that flows like just only around uh antarctica which just helps continue to drop temperatures down uh, and continue the cooling trend that we will see up until the present day. So thanks, Antarctica. You're a lifeless wasteland nowadays, but you've been really important. So thank you. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. I know that was kind of a throwaway line, but I thought there was, <laughs> I, I thought there was like some amount of, uh, of life, like some penguins and stuff that were going on. Yeah, there's some penguins. There's some like lichens. I think there's like technically a couple species of like plants, but like... But nothing worth, you know, nothing worth discussing? Not currently there. Antarctica's had a, okay. also had a really crazy evolutionary history, which I would love to also make an episode about. I'm looking at, uh, I just did a quick Google. Are you talking about the Antarctic circumpolar or the Antarctic subpolar ocean current? Circumpolar. Circumpolar. Okay, yep. not circumcised, circumpolar. Jesus, Thank Mike. You, uh, okay. Moving on. <laughs> so the uh, Oligocene was the last epic of the Paleogene. And now we move on to the Neogene period, which lasted from 23.03 million years ago to about 2.58 million years ago. So real recent, lasting about 20.45 million years. The first epic of the Neogene is the period, or the, the epic that I study, the Miocene, which lasted from that 23.03 million years to 5.33 million years, a total of 17.66 million years. Basically, the age of horses. Oh, this is where you come in. This is where I come in, yes. So horses go crazy during the Miocene. So today we have, I think, like four or five different species of horses, all in a single genus. During this time... There were like dozens and dozens of species of horse all just kicking around together. Crazy, crazy times. And all of them, you would be able to look at it and be like, oh, that's a horse. So it's like they weren't all that different, but they were just everywhere. And there was a lot of them. Would we say they were, were they like the dominant species on the planet at the time? Or is that just not a thing? It's not really a thing. I mean, like I hesitate to even... Maybe this is me thinking like a little human centrically, but like no animal, no single species has ever really been like as dominant as humans have been over like the entire planet. Because with this, we're talking about different, even um, potentially subfamilies. There were several different subfamilies of horses. Um, They're all in the family Equidae, but 
uh, different subfamilies, and then different tribes, which is another uh, clade as well uh, of, of horses, different tribes, all doing different, slightly different things. Um, if there was one group that, like, I would say during the Miocene was dominant, just like one group, yes, I would I'd 100% say horses for this time. Okay. So they were they were everywhere. To say they were dominant is probably the wrong term, but you're thinking along the same lines using that. Yeah, like, I would say they they were very, like, ecologically dominant. Understood. So we have our first apes here as well. Oh, I missed a bullet. Maybe. So the reason why horses were doing so well is because grasslands finally get to about what we see today. And what do horses eat? Grass. Grass. So the, the first horses did not. They ate mostly leaves and stuff. But there were a couple that started to eat grass. And they just became super, super successful because now we just had loads and loads of grass. So, um, anyway, apes, true apes. First of all, if here we've had monkeys, we've had primates for quite a while at this point, but our first real apes, uh, evolve. And then by the end, our ancestors had separated from chimpanzees, our closest relatives. And what are they called? So they would be the subfamily hominine. Uh, I, I don't quite remember the actual like genus or species, um, but by, by this point, our lineage was separate from, from the chimpanzee lineage. So okay. not like great times a few million, like we were talking about ancestors with uh, like the first tetrapods, only great by like a couple hundred thousand. So that's a reasonable difference. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, mostly modern animals, but sometimes in very different places than we see them today. For example, uh, we had lots and lots of camels. In North America, which we don't currently have, we had lots and lots of rhinos in North America, which we don't currently have. Yeah, just things in weird places where you would see it and be like, you like you'd be able to easily tell, okay, that's a rhino, but you don't belong here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, pretty much everything on the planet, you'd be able to look at it and be like, okay, I know what you are. By this point, um, whales and pinnipeds, which are uh, your seals, walrus, sea lions, they're at their peak diversity that they will be at during this time period. And because of that, because we have lots of large things swimming around the ocean, we have one of the most popular uh, extinct species of all time, Megalodon. Dun, dun, dun. This was in the wa this is a water one, right? Yes, that is that giant, okay. like, 60-foot shark. That's right, okay. 60 might be a little long, but close. Um, real, real big shark because it was eating whales. <laughs> that That's why Megalodon was so successful because there was lots of big whales around at this eating time. Eating a whale. My Granted, th these whales were not as big as like blue whales today. Um, okay, fine. But larger than like, larger than orcas by this point, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that That's literally, that that's why... <laughs> Side yeah, tangent here. This is wild. Do you ever think about that? Just how wild this planet is sometimes. Absolutely. Um, and so the, the reason why, like, some people are like, oh, Megalodon could still be alive. It could just live in the really deep oceans. I'm like, no. Like, it, it ate whales. We don't have enough of them because we killed all of them. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are just not enough whales to sustain Megalodon populations anymore. There's just not. Anyway, side tangent aside. Something that's also super underrated during this time period that I feel like is not talked about all that much, but kelp forests first evolved during the Miocene. And even today, most people don't think about kelp forests. I know I don't, uh, but they are probably the most productive, one of the most productive environments on the planet in terms of like sucking up carbon. It basically goes like rainforests, coral reefs, and then kelp forests. Super, super important ecosystems, um, which helped continue to drive down uh, global temperatures. We have lots of our modern mountains forming around this time, such as the Himalayas and the Andes. Uh, those really mess with global climate patterns because they're so tall that they mess up like air currents that flow from continent to continent. So again, just lots of funky stuff going on with global climate at this time. Uh, climate continues to cool. 
And we have our first northern glaciers up in Greenland. And the Antarctic uh, glaciers get to about modern size. And once again, South America is still super weird. But now we just barely start to contact North America. So that ends off the Miocene and gets us into the Pliocene. About 5.33 to 2.58 million years, lasting only a little under 3 million years. This one's quite short. We're getting pretty close to, like, today. Uh, yes, Do we... humans end up showing up here? Uh, not quite humans. Um, yeah, I, I don't even think our genus shows up uh, in the Pliocene. I think it shows up toward the beginning of the next one, which we will talk about. So we're getting close, though. We're getting real close. So we have... Uh, the first North American glaciers uh, occur here. So technically Greenland is part of North America, but on like the mainland of North America, first North American glaciers start to occur. Earth still getting real colder because it's getting colder. Deciduous trees start to expand because it's, you know, not just like getting colder. It's just, that means that seasonality is becoming much more of a thing. So there's much more of a difference between summer and winter. So because of that, deciduous trees have a pretty significant advantage over, uh, you know, evergreen trees. The world basically looks like today. Um, tropical forest, pretty much only around the equator, like today. We have the the tundra and, and pine forests near the, the poles, especially the North Pole. The world looks almost essentially like it does today, which makes sense because it's only, you know, less than five million years ago. Most animals we have today were probably around, even to the point of like, maybe not species, but a lot of the genera. Uh, you know, plural of genus, was, were, were around by this time. Uh, including lots of things that we also don't currently have. Lots of really big mammals. Um, there is like an ecological principle that basically states like the colder temperatures are, the larger animals we get, will get, especially for mammals. So this is when a lot of things like your mammoths come around. Uh, a lot of things like your giant ground sloths come around. Can I take a guess as to why that is? Absolutely, go ahead. Is that just that larger animals are able to conserve heat and, you know, and maybe in some cases produce their own heat a lot better than small animals where they just could not make enough heat. It would all kind of dissipate away and they wouldn't be able to stay warm enough. You got it. Okay. It is basically, if you want to get into like a little of the math behind it, it's basically like a surface area to volume ratio thing. So I didn't realize we were a math podcast, but let's do it. So basically this cube um, square law. Pretty much, yes. Yes! So, like, as your, um, you know, volume increases, your surface area, your proportionate surface area kind of increases as well. So, smaller things just have, like, less mass and less volume to keep stuff, to keep, like, heat in. Whereas bigger things have more mass, more volume to hold on to that heat and will lose heat uh, less quickly. More or less. They have less surface area. Like, technically, it, it's that, like, surface area goes up exponentially with, with volume. So I guess that's not a great example to use. Um, but it's, it's a similar sort of principle. Okay. Um, we can roll with that and move on, I suppose. Okay, yeah. I don't know why I brought math into this. I'm not a math person. Um, <laughs> why, why am I like this? Anyway. Um, so, again, lots of really, really big mammals cruising around. Uh, we have lots of crossover between Asia and North America uh, through like Alaska, basically, um, which is how we over here get things like deer um, or, or any like uh, bovids. So cows, essentially cows and goats. Um, those were not here in North America until this time, which is weird. Um you know, today, considering we have everything from like bison to like mountain goats, you know, in, in North America, they're pretty common. Hominins, our ancient ancestors, doing quite well. Um, hey, oh. There there's several different kinds of them, you know, instead of just the single uh, genus that we have around today. There were several different genera around, all cruising around. Still mostly just Africa at this point. I think some of them had gotten into uh, Asia and Europe, but that's, that's about it uh, for them at this point. And then by the end of the Pliocene, North and South America finally collide, exchanging animals with the northern animals absolutely dominating <laughs> the, the southerners. Um, like I said, we will have a full episode about this eventually. And that ends 
both the Pliocene epoch and the Neogene period, which moves us into the final period we're going to talk about called the Quaternary, which is from 2.58 until the present. So 2.58 million years ago until the present. Uh, and it starts with a, an epic that we have actually talked about before, the Pleistocene. Yes, this was our Pleistocene rewilding episode, if I remember correctly. Absolutely. So this was 2.58 million years ago to only 11,700 years ago. So big order of magnitude shift there. <laughs> um, this is what most people call the Ice Age. Basically modern life, just colder with larger mammals, such as, your again, your things like mammoths, ground sloths. We had some giant apes, like 10 foot tall apes, basically Bigfoot. They, <laughs> they really existed. You know, there's uh, uh, something that's sort of like an orangutan cousin called Gigantopithecus. That's actually... Gigantop yep, that, I love these names. And that, that uh, Gigantopithecus is actually featured in um, the more recent like live action type uh, Jungle Book movie. King really? Louis is a Gigantopithecus. Hmm. So if you have Disney Plus, give it a watch. Um, we have giant birds, once again, in South America, mostly. We have giant dogs, giant rhinos, giant armadillos. Literally, <laughs> I feel like pretty much every mammal group at this point has like a giant member during the Pleistocene. Super cool, super weird. Um, the first member of our genus, called Homo erectus. Mike, please don't laugh. Um, <laughs> I've actually heard of that one before. Oh, good. Um, so, yes, Homo erectus evolves, leaves Africa for the first time. Uh, at least in our genus, leaves leaves and, Africa. And then it becomes Homo sapien, right? It goes from Homo erectus to Homo sapien? Um, I think... I think there's a species in between. I know there is a homo, I think there's a Homo habilis. Okay. Um, and then it's arguable whether Neanderthals were a different species than us, or whether we're different subspecies. So whether it's Homo neanderthalensis or Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, whereas Homo sapiens would be Homo sapiens sapiens would be the subspecies name. Okay. But neither Homo sapiens nor uh uh. Neanderthals were quite around yet, uh, at least toward the beginning. By the end, true humans, meaning Homo sapiens, were um, pretty much around. They, they had just barely gotten around. We show up around 200,000 years ago. So we are relatively young. We are quite young for a species. And then by the end of the Pleistocene, all of those really big things... They just kind of go extinct, and we don't really know why. We think, as usual with extinctions, it's a combination of things. Could be rapid climate changes, could be overhunting by humans. You know, pretty typical of humans. Um, <laughs> but like I said, probably some kind of combination of the two. Does this count as a mass extinction, or is this just, there are, is this like a much smaller order of magnitude? It is definitely a much smaller order of magnitude. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, there are people who sort of argue that, you know, we are currently in a mass extinction right now. And I've that, heard that one, and I'd be curious to do an episode on that to see kind of what the what the breakdowns on that are. Yeah, I I would also like to do an episode about that at some point. Um, but people who argue that, who, who have like a paleontology background, who argue that we are currently in mass extinction, argue that it started here when, with all of this big stuff going extinct. So it's not just, you know, the human caused climate change uh, causing this mass extinction because obviously humans were not emitting significant carbon dioxide um, back in the Pleistocene. So arguably this is when mass extinction number six starts. But yeah, by the end, humans were probably the only hominin left potentially a couple other species around uh, on some various islands. Like I know there is um, a couple like dwarf species uh, in the genus Homo um, in like the Indo-Pacific area. There's a couple dwarf species that have been found from over there, but I think they were all gone uh, by the end of the Pleistocene. And that takes us to 11,700 years ago to the present, which is the epic called the Holocene. And that's literally just today. <laughs> that's where podcasts come in. 
This is exactly where podcasts come in. Now, there's an argument so for people proposing um, a new epic. Uh, so for the Holocene to end, I think the proposed date is like 1950 something. Uh, for a new epic called the Anthropocene. Uh, that sounds like Anthropocene. Like, am I am I crazy here? An- Anthropocene. Yes. Before. Yep. Okay. Yep. So basically saying that like humans have changed the planet so much that it deserves its own geological time period or section of geological time. What do you think about that? I, I personally probably agree. Like there's arguments for and against it, but like at this point, humans move more sediment than the rest of the planet does like by itself. Wow. Yeah. I didn't Um, realize that. Yeah. The amount of like plastic in the oceans is for sure going to affect the the rock records in in you know millions and millions of years from now. I'm positive that that's going to show up, um, even if it's just like increased levels of hydrocarbons. Because by that point, uh, you know, plastic does take a really long time to break down, but like in 10 million years or so, it'll be broken down into just like its base hydrocarbons. Um, I, I could be persuaded either way, but I'm leaning more toward that. Yeah, it's probably worth doing. Understood. And so, with what we're working with now, with the Holocene, which would include the Anthropocene from just under twelve thousand years ago, is there anything of note that we need to say, or is it just kind of you know the the Earth as we know it? It is literally just the Earth as we know it, because so the last like major, especially like North American glaciations, I know that there were like Eurasian glaciations as well. But, you know, my earth science education, especially of like the most recent stuff, is very much North America centric because that is where I was educated. So I know that there were glaciations over there, but they were not as far reaching as the North American ones. Um, but the, the last major episode of glaciation was about 18-ish, 20-ish thousand years ago, somewhere around there. So ever since they've been retreating. So we, we definitely are in like an interglacial period that is, that is natural. So when people are like, Oh, you know, the earth's been warming for thousands of years. I'm like, yes, you are technically right. Like I'm, I'm not going to argue that with you, but you are making a bad faith argument about climate change. Uh, and that is exactly something that we can leave for yes. another time is how climate change works. It took us twice as long as we originally set out to do, but we did it. We have done 600 million years now in, uh, in 120 minutes. Congratulations, Gavin. This was, this was one hell of an undertaking on your part, being able to compile all these notes in one place. And then, you know, talking through everything that happened and answering my oddball questions, you know, just kind of as they came up, this was, this was an impressive job on your part. Well, thank you. So as I, as I mentioned, sort of before we started recording the, the last episode, um, I was like, honestly, I wanted a little bit of a refresher myself because especially <laughs> like during my master's thesis, like I said, I focus on not, not even like just the Miocene because like the Miocene is uh, only like a little under 18 million years long, but I focus on like one specific slice of the Miocene. So it's like, I only focus on a, on a time slice that's like 2 million years long, if that. So it's nice to sort of refresh myself about the rest of Earth uh, and its history, and also to sort of fish for future episode ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a great one for future episode ideas, I have to say. Absolutely. We have, what, climate change, South America. Uh, Antarctica. Antarctica. Yeah. The giant rhino things. All of it is uh, <laughs> I'm de- what I'm definitely looking forward to. Thank you to everybody out there who has made it all the way through, especially shout out to number one fan of the podcast, Fia. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. Um, by the time you guys are listening to this, we may have some new cover art. If not next time, then I think the time after that, we're going to have some brand new cover art. And I will talk more about that once I have full permission to. But I think that just about wraps it up for this week. So, Gavin, thank you very much for walking us through all of that over the last two episodes. Absolutely. It has been an absolute pleasure. Same here. Thank you, everybody. Take care.